All right, to start off, uh, we just want to say thank you to our sponsors. Um, so our sponsors are Peach Payments. Um, Peach Payments makes uh, online commerce and digital payment acceptance easier and more accessible across Africa. Um, if you're interested in what they do or if your company could use their service, have a look at peachpayments.com. Um, and our other core sponsors are OfferZen, and OfferZen is an online job marketplace by developers for developers. Um, if you are a developer currently looking for a job or your company is currently recruiting for engineers, uh, have a look at OfferZen.com. So that's that for the sponsors. Um, some of, for those who are returning to the Tech Leadership Meetup, you will be aware that we have a Tech Leadership Newsletter um, that we release once a month. So we always release it after the meetup. So there'll be one going out this evening. What it is, is a curated list of content we found online that is useful uh, for people who are interested in tech leadership. So articles that will help you learn and grow in your tech leadership space. And this is an example of one that went out last year. So this was the November one. So as I say, it's just a collection of links with content around tech leadership. Um, at the end of my intro, I'll drop a link to the homepage for the newsletter where if you're interested in receiving this once a month, uh, you can put in your email address and, uh, and sign up for it. If you're on Twitter, we also have a Tech Leadership Twitter space uh, where we also share curated content about tech leadership. Um, so at least a, it, it's about a tweet a day that we'll push out. And we also inform you of up and coming meetups and uh, details around those events. So if you are on Twitter, uh, you can follow our account to keep up to date and also keep uh, learning from the curated content we post there. Uh, again, I'll share the link to, the, to our Twitter page um, after this intro. And then offers in our sponsor, as I mentioned, uh, is offering swag to attendees of the meetup today. So if you, uh, fill in this. If you go to this uh, page and you fill in this form uh, with their details, they will send you uh, some swag from offers in. Um, I think developers are always excited about that. I will also again drop a link to this right after my intro now. Uh, you can just quickly fill that in uh, now or just post the meetup and they'll be in touch with you. And then to the topic and main event of the day. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Zusisa Chidembo, who is the head of engineering at Founders Factory Africa. Um, and he's joining us tonight to speak with this main topic being questions that transformed a developer into a venture builder. Uh, we're excited to have him here. And with that, I will stop sharing and hand over to Zui. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Tanaka. Uh, firstly, I just want to say that that offers in swag is real. Uh, I think I think I've received uh, you know a T-shirt if I'm not mistaken uh, from from using that link. So really appreciate this. Uh, I think firstly I just want to say thanks to the Tech Leadership Meetup team uh, for reaching out and giving me this opportunity to share some of my learnings and basically share my journey uh, through the tech space. Um, I mean, it's, it's been incredible. Uh, and I've also learned a lot uh, via the Tech Leadership uh, Forum. So uh, kudos to you guys for keeping this going. I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, so just please uh, confirm if you can see it on your end. Yep, we can see it. Oh, fantastic, cool. So as, as, as was said, uh, my name is Nzwisisa Chidembo. Everybody calls me Nzui. Uh, and I head up engineering at Founders Factory Africa. Uh, for my talk today, I'm gonna be sharing a bit about my journey. Uh, and the theme uh, that I thought about was just questions that uh, transformed a developer into a venture builder. So in essence, I'm going to be going through about five questions uh, that I had to ask myself from very early on in my life uh, to questions that I'm asking myself uh, as we speak uh, today. Uh, so my hope is that you will enjoy uh, and uh, that you will learn, uh, but mostly you have a glimpse of uh, the world of venture building 
uh, and be inspired to, 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 to join this, this amazing space. So I did not put this deck uh, by myself. Uh, when I was starting out, my daughter Rudolwashe joined me and started typing away. So I think she definitely deserves uh, some, some credits uh, for, for putting this deck together. On the right-hand side of the deck are just some of my career highlights. Over the last couple of years, as mentioned, I've been building and scaling 88 tech-enabled startups across the continent as part of the Founders Factory Africa team. We are currently at uh, business number 45, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we've been able to get to that number after about three years. So we, we really are uh, churning along and, and, and just doing an amazing job from that perspective. Another one of my career highlights is, is that I'm a published author. This was not by design. Uh, this, this, this was more so uh, by chance. Uh, so when I had completed my master's degree um, in information technology, I was uh, basically approached by a German publisher to transform my thesis into, into, into a book in order for the community to also benefit. And that thesis was around near field communication technology and how that enables mobile payments. And this is now popularly known as tap and go and tap and, tap and pay and is used uh, on a day-to-day -day basis at great volume. So I think it was, uh, it was a matter of me focusing in on something uh, that was important earlier on and just benefiting from the uplift as adoption grew from that perspective. Another one of my uh, career highlights is being selected as a global young ICT leader by the International Telecommunications Union in 2017. So the ITU is the highest technology and communications policy formulating body in the world. And as part of that cohort, uh, they flew us out to Busan, South Korea, and, and introduced us to the government officials and some of the technology gurus who revealed to us some of the technologies that they were working on. I mean, it was a really interesting uh, process. Uh, they walked us into this amazing command center where they were monitoring the city in real time. Uh, they had uh, you know, IoT devices that were monitoring the, the streams, the rivers basically, uh, in terms of the water levels and, and just feeding that into, into this amazing uh, platform that they had built. They also showcased to us things like smart light poles that you know, one could actually go and bang on them and, and they would basically call uh, someone uh, to uh, provide assistance if, for instance, a resident is in distress. Uh, they showed, showcased uh, these smart, uh, what would I call them, uh, tiles basically, that one could put on the ground and generate electricity as pedestrians would walk on top. So it was super eye-opening to see how the future of cities is gonna be like uh, with some of these uh, interesting technology. So these are some of my passions. I'm a big off-roading fan. Uh, you'll see on the right left-hand side, a picture that I took when I was back home recently. And that's a line of Land Cruiser 100s. They're called Masters of Africa. And this was the reason why I, I, I became a big off-roading fan in that uh, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity of being a part of a team that was setting up mining operations. And out of all the vehicles that we had, this includes Nissans and Mitsubishis, only the, 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 the Land Cruiser 100s were able to survive that event. So since then I've been a big off-roading fan and I enjoy you know, just uh, tackling uh, sketchy trails. So if you know any trails close to Joba, please let me know. And if you wanna join me, um, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, you can, you can definitely join me and enjoy the ride. Um, I'm also a bass fisherman. Uh, what you will notice here is the absence of, uh, of a picture of a fish, because I'm most probably the worst bass fisherman that you will meet. Um, I, I'm totally horrible at it. I've caught everything else, crabs, frogs. I'm still looking for that elusive bass. Um, but I love it to death. I mean, I just enjoy being out in nature. 
I'm also a big football fan. I saw Tanaka wearing his jersey. So that's, that's the team that I support. I'm not going to say their name because that's the reason why I don't watch football anymore uh, because of the abuse that firstly, the team gives its supporters. And secondly, uh, the abuse that I get every time I wear my jersey. I mean, it's, it's, it's getting pretty ridiculous now. And that picture on the left bottom is the Okavanga Delta. So that's uh, in Botswana. And my dream vacation is to go to the Okavanga Delta uh, with a brand new land cruiser, all kitted up to support life off grid. So that's a bit about me. Hopefully, you know, when you meet me in the streets, we'll have something to talk about around some of these uh, topics and areas of interest. I'm also a big fan of answering this question, what is a digital asset? So catch me on the social networks, sharing my conversations with uh, other individuals within this space who are also interested, sharing signals uh, and sharing all sorts of developments as uh, basically this new reality gets built uh, in front of our very eyes. So as mentioned uh, before, I'm gonna be sharing five specific questions around um, how I developed from being a developer uh, to being um, a venture builder. And this is a quote from one of my colleagues who's always <laughs> bringing it up that it's important to know how to ask the right questions and not, not, not necessarily having all the answers at that specific point. And I think this, this is gonna echo a lot as I go through some of the questions that have uh, helped me to develop within the technological landscape. So the first question that I had to answer very early on in my life was just how to get uh, free satellite channels. I'm gonna uh, play a sound and hopefully some of you quickly uh, uh, pick up on what sound this is. Uh, leverage the chat to, 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 to jump in and, and provide your guesses. So firstly, I hope that sound came through, but that's the sound of Windows 95. So that's, that's the original sound of Windows 95. And basically uh, in the mid 1990s, uh, my parents uh, traveled to Australia and they came back with a personal computer. And this personal computer was, was a Pentium machine running Windows 95. And it was the first PC, if I can put it that way, in our home uh, that was publicly accessible to anyone else that was in the home. My father went about uh, ensuring that it was connected to the internet. And I started experiencing web one, as I would call it, uh, and the internet uh, highway or in the information highway. Uh, what was interesting though, is that during the same period, uh, another interesting development was taking place. That was the proliferation of satellite technology. And my parents went about purchasing a satellite dish. However, they didn't buy the, the popular multi-choice decoder, but they ended up getting uh, some, some, some funny decoders uh, that, that, that caught some of the other channels that were available. What, what then happened was that leveraging the internet, I, I discovered that there was a website uh, that had a list of frequencies, uh, frequencies that one could tune in and uh, get access to, to free channels from Asia, Europe, uh, and sometimes even, even America. And so I went about spending a ridiculous amount of time and effort learning all these different frequencies and, and just learning how to, how to actually configure the decoder uh, to get free channels from, from all over the world. I know I'll, I'll, I would watch channels that, I, I mean, I wouldn't even understand because of the language barrier, uh, but it was still a really fun exercise. 
So with, with that context in mind, I want to introduce you to a gentleman by the name of Forbes Kuchera. So Forbes is, is late now, uh, but I'll call him the fisherman. Uh, why? Because Forbes was a serial entrepreneur and he basically had a fleet of fishing, commercial fishing boats. These commercial fishing boats were in Lake Kariba, uh, that's, that's on the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia, as well as fishing boats in Mozambique by the coast. He, he not only focused on just fishing, but he had managed to grow his operations in such a way that uh, he had gone up the value chain. Uh, he had now the capability of packaging the fish um, and preparing the fish and selling them directly to the retailer. So he was a really smart man. Uh, not, he was not only involved in fishing, but uh, he also had uh, farms uh, where he had quite, quite a number of livestock. Uh, so, so that is uh, Forbes Kucherera, the fisherman. So my initial connection with Forbes Kucherera is that we belonged to the same um, denomination from a church perspective. And so it happened that between, nine, you know, between 1995 and, and the late 1990s, our denomination decided to have this amazing project of broadcasting a single signal from America uh, to you know, nations across the world, basically. And they were gonna broadcast them in different languages. And the objective was to have at least, you know, 7,000 plus download sites across the world. And so Forbes Kuchera being the, you know, generous businessman that he was, he went about sponsoring some of these download sites. But what, what then happened was that they didn't have anyone to configure these uh, unique decoders. And for some reason or another, he, he found out that I could uh, basically configure the heck out of a decoder. And so we, we became an unlikely team. Uh, for a couple of weeks, we were basically transversing throughout Harare and some of the satellite towns, configuring uh, these decoders in preparation for, for this evangelistic meeting, if I can call it that way. But for me, what was uh, pretty amazing was just having this experience to link up with a businessman, uh, for him to share his experiences of building uh, businesses uh, and some of his challenges that he had faced. And my initial impression was, wow, this is, this is amazing to be, to be an entrepreneur. It's amazing to be a businessman. I, I want to be like that one of these days. So I'll remember, I remember one specific scenario. We had to go to Chitungiza, which is a satellite town uh, just outside of Harare. Um, the site that we were going to ha was having challenges with their configuration. And it was just before the signal was about to, 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 to start. And so, you know, we got there, you know, it was a massive church, massive congregation. Uh, Forbes Kuchera then pointed uh, the elders to me and said, there is your technician who's gonna fix your, your satellite dish. And I remember the surprised faces that they had, uh, but the pressure did not stop there. Like when I, when I looked at the congregation, um, they were also surprised and in awe at this young, young boy. I think at the time I was, I was about 11 or 12 years old coming through to, to configure the satellite dish. But the confidence that uh, Forbes gave me uh, made it possible for us to figure out what was wrong. Um, and uh, basically we managed to get that site up and running. Um, why this question of how to get free satellite channels was very relevant in my journey of transitioning from being you know, a developer to, to being a venture builder is that earlier on, I discovered the importance of technology to connect remote communities. That was uh, for me, a, a big eye opener. But then what I also realized was that, you know, it also allowed me to actually connect with Forbes. 
I do not see any other scenario whereby, you know, me being inquisitive about satellites and, and leveraging uh, the internet would have allowed me to, to, to connect with a businessman who was, who was so busy and uh, accomplished in his own right. But this for me was sort of the first, um, uh, the first inkling of me realizing that uh, technology had uh, a great power and it was only the beginning uh, uh, from that perspective. So the second question that I had to, to, to answer um, through my journey was just learning how to code. I, I had the privilege of un, uh, attending Anderson High School, uh, also in Zimbabwe, uh, close to a town called Gweru, which is smack in the middle of Zimbabwe. And, you know, when I, when I got to Anderson High School, like most boarding schools, they have what, what they call the work program, although you don't necessarily get paid for it, it's free labor. Uh, and I was, I was you know, enrolled into the laundry department where our job was to basically shuttle students' laundry back and forth between the dormitories as well as um, the laundry room. However, you know, we had a computer lab and so my friend worked within that computer lab and uh, I started talking with him, uh, seeing if I could uh, get, a, get an opportunity to work within the computer lab. And so we colluded after I think a semester or two uh, to get me into the computer lab and I started uh, my new job there. But what was of interest to me was uh, the one desktop that we had that was connected to the internet. And I made uh, great use of it. When I was about 15 years old, I started applying to university uh, to, to basically try and learn how to code uh, in, the, in the one place that I kind of knew the best coders were, and that's, that's in the US. So after applying, I, I, I was accepted into a couple of universities. Uh, but I selected to go to Walla Walla University, which is in Washington. So I had never been to America, mind you. Um, and in my head, I was like, oh, Washington, fantastic. Washington, DC, I'm gonna be where it's happening close to the seat of power. Not realizing that uh, Walla Walla University was actually in Washington state, which is on the west, northwest, uh, far away from the seat of power, if I can put it that way. And, and so I only realized this when we're actually purchasing the tickets, um, when my parents started quizzing me on why it is that I wanted to go so far away, uh, but I just bit the bullet and then just basically, you know, acted as if I knew what I was doing uh, and off I was to the Northwest of America. Initially, I thought I'd made a, a horrible mistake um, however, I quickly realized that, I mean, it was, it was a pleasant mistake. I mean, the institution, uh, especially the computer science program there was a feeder program for Microsoft. So the professors there were, were really top notch. I remember even the students, uh, I, I always felt as though I was, I, was, I was behind everyone else. I had one specific a classmate who would literally walk around with, 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 with one hand holding a laptop and the other hand coding. I could never, you know, figure out how the heck he was able to transverse uh, the entire campus with that stance. But what he was working on was, was pretty amazing stuff. I think at that point in time, he was building a social network. This was still early days of Facebook and, and the other social networks that were, that were up and coming. So for me, I, I guess being at Walla Walla University, I really uh, got to, to learn how to code uh, from amazing uh, professors there uh, who, who really grilled to us some of the key principles when it comes to uh, building and maintaining uh, a good code base. Uh, however, I was also involved in many other activities. I was, uh, you know, I played Division I uh, football uh, when I was there and got the chance to travel the, the whole of the West Coast 
uh, with the team, uh, but also just enjoyed the diversity of just interacting with individuals from uh, all over the world and, and, and all over, you know, uh, America. So that was, that for me was a very, very interesting experience. I recall uh, the most difficult class that uh, I took there and most probably the most difficult class that I've ever taken. And that was the, 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 you know, the high level algorithm class uh, when one is about to graduate. And this class was so difficult in that no one in our, you know, in our class was able to finish that course in time. We all had to stay over for another week uh, to complete the problems that uh, that we had been have we had been given, and basically, I mean, we had to collaborate tightly to to get that job done. Um, the course was basically about six questions uh, for 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 the entire semester. So it was initially we thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be a breeze, uh, but uh, soon we realized that man, there was there was more to it. Uh, so, so we learned we learned about algorithms, uh, but I think what's most important is that through that process we we learned a lot about problem solving, and this brings about, uh, you know, this question that that I had to answer of how to code, uh, through my process, you know, in 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 varsity as well as in high school, I kind of learned how to solve problems instead. When I was in varsity, I faced many different challenges besides uh, the, 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 uh, just the, the coding aspect and, and the tertiary aspect. And just you know, having, having that experience of being away at such a young age, I think I was 16 when I started varsity, um, having to, to, to uh, be you know, exposed to culture shock, uh, being in a place that I didn't know, being far away from home, far away from family, um, and just having to solve such problems, I think really shaped me into, into who I am. And just also having that ability to, uh, to engage with individuals from different walks of life. I had a policy in varsity of hanging out with someone from a different culture or a different country for each and every semester. So I ended up knowing a lot of people, but I also ended up having this ability of just, just getting to, 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 to know the differences uh, from a culture perspective uh, when it came to the student body. So that, that said, the next question that I had to answer uh, through my journey of you know, transitioning from a developer to a venture builder was, was simply how to get a job. And I think this is, this is a question that most of us uh, have to ask ourselves at some point in time uh, in our journey. And to begin with, I want to introduce you to a man by the name of uh, Dr. Milan uh, Davilius. And I'll call him the serial entrepreneur uh, because uh, that's what he is. So, so Dr. Milan Davilius, uh, he's a PhD in, in bio, bioengineering. And he gave me my first shot uh, after, after finishing my degree uh, in the corporate world, as I would put it. And up to now, I don't understand why he gave me that opportunity. Um, I, I, I need to reach out to him and ask him that question. However, you know, Milan was, was a very interesting individual in that he was a pioneer uh, within the biotech space. Uh, he had been part of a team uh, that uh, basically engineered and started manufacturing the first artificial heart valve on the continent. So he was, he was truly uh, uh, you know, a thought leader within his, uh, you know, his space. And what, what stood out for me with, uh, with Milan when I was working for him was just how he built businesses. So Milan had an interesting process uh, when he wanted to build a business or start a new, or basically attack a new opportunity. He would identify uh, a, a very talented individual within, within the health space 
And then he would bring that individual into our offices, uh, basically give them a desk, uh, give them a laptop, give them uh, internet access, but, and, and, and basically start funding that individual. And, and one would actually start seeing the business grow. I, when I was working with him, it was quite interesting for me because I think, I think I worked with him for over maybe two, two, two years, just uh, about. And during that time, I think he rolled out maybe three businesses. Um, mind you, he was still building his own business, which, which was also a biotech uh, business. Uh, but this, this experience was, was very interesting to me because I was reporting directly to him, but what would end up happening was that I had to work uh, with uh, some of these entrepreneurs directly as well as they set up operations. And I would uh, use technology to just make sure that everything from their end is optimal. Um, as they built their business. So that is, that is one of the key aspects that I learned uh, from Milan, uh, his key ability to basically enable others to, 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 to start building businesses. But this ability to actually uh, work with entrepreneurs from a very early stage um, and, and, and build them up and provide them that support. So that's, that's Milan de Villiers, uh, the serial entrepreneur who I had an opportunity to work with. Another inter interesting individual that I had uh, the pleasure to work with was called Pommy, uh, Pommy Lichman. And I'll call him the visionary. Um, he ran a business that provided conversational platforms for blue chip uh, companies as well as government departments. So some of some of these clients included the likes of DSTV, Mercedes Benz, uh, and some of uh, some of the insurance businesses uh, that are very popular here in South Africa. And so uh, he, I, I call him the visionary uh, because Pami had this ability of being able to identify trends within markets. Uh, and, and have this ability of seeing opportunities that are closing up and seeing opportunities that are opening up. And so when I was working with him, we worked on building uh, some interesting AI platforms um, with uh, platforms that had a lot of ambiguity to begin with. Uh, so that is, that is one of the amazing things about working with visionaries is that there's a lot of ambiguity that comes with it. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunity to learn. So what I learned about uh, from Pommy was just this ability to just be brave enough to be the first, uh, first one out the gates. So the picture on the on the right is 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 a picture that he took of me at the Slack offices in San Francisco uh, when we went there trying to just basically get inspired and share some of the interesting projects that, uh, that we had been working on and, and the interesting solutions that we're building. So, I mean, Slack was, is, is most likely one of the most successful conversational uh, platforms around. So it was really interesting just having that experience and just being, uh, being in the presence of a startup that, that has been able to succeed to such extents. Uh, then we we you know we get to the racer. This is Mark Atia, and basically Mark was a CA uh, who founded a business called Smart Call. And Smart Call uh, basically built uh, the prepaid mobile supply chain in South Africa for 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 a couple of years. It had exclusivity when it comes to providing prepaid uh, services and SIM cards and airtime within the market. Uh, he's a highly, I'd say, very, very successful uh, businessman. And I, I worked uh, for him at SmartCall. And what always stood out to me uh, with Mark was his humility, although he, he was incredibly successful. I mean, with his business, he had, he had gone through an exit for about 1.6 billion rand. Uh, where he sold his business to, to Vodacom in two trenches. Uh, but one could never tell. 
just looking at him, uh, that, uh, that he was so successful. And so it happened that when I was working with him, my line manager at the time, Ursula, um, saw how I was progressing and basically uh, formed a bridge between uh, myself and Mark. And Mark basically began chatting with me and talking with me around what I wanted to do uh, next. And it was Mark who opened up his network to allow me to start my first business. Um, and I'll forever be grateful for his generosity uh, from that perspective, but also just uh, his, his, you know, just his ability to, um, to, to, to speak with, with someone who was really a super amateur when it comes to, to, to the business world. So uh, Mark really opened up uh, that opportunity, but also it, it made an impression on me on the importance of humility when it comes to uh, being an entrepreneur uh, and a businessman. So uh, this comes to, to the question that I had of how to get a job. Um, throughout my career, it became uh, pretty interesting that uh, that question transferred to how to leverage technology to assist founders. I had this opportunity to work with founders and report directly to them and see how they work, see how they build, see their failures, see their wins. And through that entire experience, it, it, it really made me uh, get more interested within the space of just how to assist founders in building uh, their operations. So it brings about to, I think this is our fourth question. So we are, we are, almost, uh, we are almost there. Uh, and this is, this, is the, this is the question that I had to ask, right? How to build a business. And, you know, this picture, I took it uh, a couple of years ago. You know, I, I took a snippet from the newspaper uh, in Zimbabwe. And it's a paratrooper uh, who has made a total hash of his landing into the international sports stadium. I mean, what, what stands out for me is just the impressions on people's faces, right? Like um, this, this, this was, uh, yeah, this, this was definitely a, a bad day for this guy. But it, it, it just, you know, it, for me, why I took this picture and documented it was because this is how I kind of felt when I started my first business. Uh, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a train smash uh, during those, uh, you know, early days. So basically, I started my business, and this, this was one of my, my, my very early businesses. Uh, it was called Moby Tones. And through, through Mark, the racer, uh, he was able to, to link me up to one of his business partners, who was establishing a relationship with Econet Wireless, uh, the largest mobile network operator in Zimbabwe to start providing uh, mobile value added services on their platform. And so what I, what I was able to do was just piggyback off their agreement and sign an agreement with Mark's partner uh, that allowed me to start uh, basically retailing games, images, ringtones and, and text, uh, value added text. Um, and it was, it was a really interesting experience. Uh, I, I was either the first one or the second player uh, to offer these services in Zimbabwe. Uh, in a few months, we had gone up, you know, more than 100,000 subscribers. But internally, I, I actually thought that I was a failure uh, simply because I hadn't taken into consideration my cash flows. Um, you know, the mobile network operator paid its suppliers after 90 days. And I quickly realized that, uh, you know, I was in a fix. But what, what I did learn though, was that I did not know what good looked like, right? Um, in, in, in any early stage business, being able to gather up uh, such numbers from a usage perspective is great success, but I just didn't know that. Uh, for me, success looked like having a lot of money in the bank. Um, 
and 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 being able to uh, to be, basically get by with uh, one's own own means. Uh, so that was a very uh, early lesson for me of 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 that I just did not know what good looked like uh, at that specific stage. But also, uh, you know, one of the things that I quickly learned uh, was that I needed to do more. Um, as a developer, I, I took a lot of pride in knowing technology and being zoned in from a technology perspective. And I never used to really take a lot of time to, to learn other aspects of business. And in my mind, I think I actually had an attitude of, I don't need to, uh, to learn other things. I can get by with technology. I'm, I'm good at what I do. Um, but I, I think this, this, this quote really echoes what, what I started learning pretty quickly. Um, and a lot of us know the beginning of the quote, which is, you know, a jack of all trades is a master of none. Uh, but the full quote is, it's, you know, but oftentimes better than a master of one. So early on, I, you know, during my business uh, days, I had to learn how to do a bunch of, a bunch of things, uh, such as, you know, learning a lot about business models, how to deal with government officials, uh, dealing with bankers how to deal with talent. And it was a, it was a steep uh, learning curve for me uh, coming from a technology uh, background. So this here is, is how, you know, how I, I had to learn together with the team. Uh, this is an advert that we had to put together for, for one of the other businesses that, uh, that I launched called Mobi Store, which was basically a brick and mortar uh, retail outlet that was selling communication devices. Uh, so, you know, I, I know every time I watch this, I cringe uh, at, at, at what we needed to do to get the job done. Uh, but I'll quickly share uh, for everyone's benefit. So as mentioned, I mean, I always cringe at watching this video. Uh, we we kind of had to do what needed to be done at this point in time. I think we, as a team, we, we took uh, a week or two to learn how to use uh, some of the tools and, and put that advert together. And it, it, it didn't stop there. I mean, we had to put together, you know, TV commercials, radio commercials, um, just, to, just to garner up interest from that perspective. One of the things that I did though, when, when I was, uh, you know, working on my own businesses was that I made sure that I, I got involved in, in other businesses that were being established. And, and, and this was at the incline of my father uh, who was also uh, in the process of setting up uh, other businesses. So um, I got involved from a mining perspective, just being an observer, manufacturing side of things. I was uh, basically uh, a buyer at one point in time, um, but I, I used to do anything that needed to be done. If, if, if someone needed to carry boxes, I was there so that I could just have that experience of learning how businesses run uh, that are not necessarily 
uh, tech focused or, or, or tech centric from that perspective. So I took that opportunity to learn as much as I could. Uh, I would spend at sometimes 50% of my time building my own businesses and 50% of, 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 of my other time uh, just ingrained in some of these efforts uh, to learn as much as I could. So in essence, uh, you know, when, when, when I started this journey, I, I just wanted to, to build a business, uh, but I ended up learning to be agile. Um, and uh, this, this key lesson had a big bearing for me uh, when it came to just having that ability to, trans to transition from being a developer to a venture builder. So, so we come to the last, uh, last question of the evening, and that's how to build a business that scales. And I'll introduce you to an individual by the name of Bongani Sitole. Uh, Bong says he is known for short. I call him the strategist. And how I met uh, Bongs was that I was looking for an opportunity um, and he had a gap within his team. And basically, you know, I applied for that role. I didn't get the role, but I quickly realized that uh, this gentleman was a master strategist and, and a great thinker. And, you know, for years I would bother him to, to meet up, uh, to just learn what he was working on but mostly to, to, to get his perspective on a, on a specific question that I had. And that question was how to build businesses that scale. I mean, you know, after having built my own business, uh, it wasn't the great success that I thought it would be. Um, and even the other businesses that, was, that I was, uh, you know, involved in uh, from a family perspective, they were not that great. Um, and so I always had this question of how, how can businesses scale and be tremendously successful? And so I used to share this question with Bongani quite a lot. And so it happened that Bongani started this journey, um, you know, building out Founders Factory Africa. And he, he basically reached out to me and said, hey, come and join this journey we are answering that question that we, we were always talking about of how to build businesses that scale. And as I shared earlier, you know, the objective at Founders Factory Africa is to build and scale 88 tech enabled businesses across the continent. Uh, and we are at, you know, business 45 plus minus right now. And we are, we are definitely doing this, right? Uh, I mean, We've got, we've got many successes uh, already under the belt. So please feel free to visit our website and have a look at our portfolio and some of the things that we are doing. And how, how we basically help entrepreneurs is that we, uh, we identify a market opportunity and we look for entrepreneurs that are interested in tackling that market opportunity. We provide them with funding uh, but not only that, but we also provide them with tailored support in order to support them in, in building out a business that will tackle that specific market opportunity. So that's, that's sort of the build business. But from a scale perspective, we also team up with entrepreneurs that are a bit further along during their growth phase. Uh, we provide them similar support, um, although a bit light when it comes to especially the engineering side of things. Uh, but with the same objective of making sure that uh, they are geared up to reach uh, that next milestone. But through, through this experience of helping entrepreneurs you know, across the continent, what, what has stood out for me is just the amazing team uh, that I've had the pleasure to work with. Uh, you know, with most businesses, one tends to, to work within you know, their, uh, their silo, uh, but within, within the Founders Factory Africa team, you'll find an engineer working side by side, an investment manager uh, or product manager or partnership manager uh, or, or growth hacker or you know, a design guru. And just having this ability to, 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 to easily reach out to an investment manager and, and just basically ask, you know, what, what ticks within your world? What's, what's going on within your world? How do you do what you do? For me, it has been tremendously um, 
you know, enlightening, uh, just having that ability to, to learn what makes businesses scale and what makes businesses grow um, from, a, from a venture perspective. So for me, that's been a tremendous experience. And this, this is some of the support that as the engineering uh, team we provide. So I'll give this example of uh, a business called Triplo uh, that uh, basically we were able to identify the founder. He came in with a spreadsheet um, and a vision and, and the drive to build a very incredible business. And you know, from, from that perspective, we, we started working uh, with the founder to build out these capabilities, you know, starting from the GUI layer to the networking side of things, uh, putting up DevOps um, operations, uh, building out serverless uh, uh, functions uh, to, 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 to basically support the platform. Uh, everything here, uh, but not only the technology side, but also helping him to actually build out the core engineering team and bringing out the right cadence from a governance perspective. So this, this tailored support, I think is something that uh, is, has been missing on the continent, uh, simply because money is not always the answer. Uh, they, there's this knowledge gap uh, that exists when it comes to just putting together the right foundation to allow a business to, to, to have that stance and be ready for rapid growth. So when, when, when I started this journey at Founders Factory Africa, my, my, the question that I had was how to build a business that scales. But the question that I ended up getting to answer was how to build an investable business. Because simply because, you know, what, what has been quite clear to me is that, uh, yes, when you're building a business, you've got products that, that, you know, are leveraged by the user, but the business in itself is a product. And if you are building a product slash business that is not necessarily uh, of interest to investors, you're going to find uh, yourself in a, in a very tricky situation if your goal is to build uh, that business that scales. And so, as mentioned before, just having those relationships and, and being able to lean into uh, investment managers, for instance, and ask them, hey, what are some of the you know, key hypotheses when it comes to this market opportunity that investors are discussing or focusing on? Uh, and just getting that heads up on what, what, what are the important questions for one to answer from a business perspective uh, has been truly enlightening for me uh, through this journey of just basically developing from, from being a developer to a venture builder. Uh, so I've got a bonus question. This is a question that I'm asking myself right now. And um, that's how to assist investors to discover profitable uh, digital assets. As mentioned, you know, uh, blockchain technology and what it's enabling is one of my key passions. So if you're also passionate about this space, please reach out and, and let's always, you know, have a chat uh, about uh, some of these interesting developments within this space. And that brings about to, to, to the end of uh, my presentation. I hope uh, that uh, you know, you guys were inspired and you learned something as I shared just my journey, how, how I have transitioned from, from being a developer and a, and a very proud developer to, to being a venture builder. And in this space where, um, you know, one has to, uh, to expand the mind each and every day. I'll hand it back to, to the tech leadership team. Uh, thank you so much, Zui. That was a great talk, very insightful. Uh, a lot to take away from that. Um, but I guess like I think two things that stood out, at least for me, um, you spoke a bit about people who've been in your journey and have helped you or unlock opportunities that have allowed you to get to where you are now. And yeah, I thought that was really inspiring and perhaps something to, to think about for for everyone, if you are also by yourself in a position where you can give other people opportunities. Um, 
And then, of course, the questions. I think it was great to see how your questions evolved as you as you went through the different experiences and then reflected later on them. So I think that is, yeah, that is very interesting that you can, if you always reflect back, you can probably have a different learning and a more valuable question to what you were initially asking for. So yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Um, there are quite a number of questions, uh, probably the most we've ever had. So also we are right on seven o'clock, which is normally our ending time. So I, I will make a hard call and maybe say, let's address three questions out of the rest. And we will so we'll definitely send you the rest of the questions. Perhaps there's something there where you could answer them and we could, we could rep when we send out the video and everything, we could send out answers to those questions if you're up for that. Um, but the Sounds three good. I'll ask, I'll just go first come first serve and I'll eliminate the ones from Benny and myself just to give the community a chance to ask questions. <laughs> uh, and let's quickly go through those and then we wrap up. So the first one was from Kenny, which is uh, out of the 80 ventures you have helped to scale across Africa, what is the best and the worst venture you've been involved in? <laughs> uh, that's, that's a very politically charged question. <laughs> I won't, I won't mention names, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a very interesting question. So I think, I think uh, that the best, uh, the best business that I've uh, had the pleasure to, to work on, um, I actually think it's, it's, it's one of the businesses that I'm working on currently. Um, who, and, and, and this business is, is, is attacking an NFT marketplace opportunity on the continent. Um, they have already proved tremendous uh, success at a very, very early stage, more success than, than, than what I've seen so far with, with most of our portfolio businesses. Uh, but I think it, it just, you know, I'm biased because I'm, I'm very passionate about that space. Uh, but I've worked on a, on a lot of uh, very interesting businesses. Um, one, one of the, I guess, the, the, the more challenging businesses that, uh, that I worked on um, was, was a business out of uh, West Africa. Uh, and and, and why, why it was a challenge was because the, the team was not necessarily motivated in, in bringing about tech talent to support their growth ambitions, right? Um, and this, this proved to be quite a hindrance for their growth, uh, growth process. It was an early lesson to me as well that, you know, there's a right time to, to bring in the right talent uh, to support those growth ambitions and there's a wrong time. But I think just, just um, that experience of, of them not really jumping into, uh, you know, de-risking their, their operations at that stage had a big impact on me. And I've, I've, I've changed my, the way I approach building uh, from 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 that experience in a big way, I I can share it at another point. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you for addressing that question in a politically correct way. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question is: uh, In your journey, have you ever had mental fatigue, and how did you overcome that? Sure. Yeah, I've, uh, definitely. I think um, I've, 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 I've had it quite a bit and how I have tried to manage it is, is just having, having a lot of different interests that don't necessarily have to do with what I do each and every day. Uh, so, you know, you will see from my deck earlier on, I mentioned a couple of my other interests, but uh, there's a whole lot more uh, behind that. And you know, just just staying fit and staying healthy um, is 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 also very important to me uh, in terms of just keeping me keeping me running. I think earlier on, I I, I quickly discovered that the technology space is more uh, it requires uh, a lot from from an individual, um, and one has to stay healthy. If 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 you are not running at least once a week. 
uh, I, I personally, I feel you're going to have problems at some point in time. So take care of yourself. Uh, that will allow you to take care of everyone else, be it the business or the users. Uh, but I, be, I definitely believe that's a that's a key uh, that's a key secret around just staying fresh within this high pressure world. Cool. Thank you. I think that's a great answer for. I think a very important question for this tech field that we're in. Um, and then the last question we'll ask uh, is, I think someone who knows you, so they say long time, <laughs> uh, it's Tamanda. How, how much of your journey would you credit to your own efforts versus luck or opportunities? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't believe in luck. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and everyone else, I, I don't necessarily believe in luck. Um, but I, I, I have, you know, I do believe in, in, in the aspect of being in, in the right place at the right time, but also leveraging some of our, our, our God-given uh, blessings, as I call them. And, and the one blessing is, is relationships. So one should always foster relationships and try by all means to grow relationships because you don't know where your opportunity is going to come from. Uh, the second one is time. Uh, we only have a limited amount of time in this world. Uh, so using it to the best of one's abilities is critical. And the third one is, is, is being inquisitive. Um, I think, I think that just those three things um, anyone can meet anyone. Um, time is available to everyone. Uh, being inquisitive is also a choice. So uh, those three aspects, I believe, have, have, have had a great bearing in, in, in allowing me to, to basically be able to see and, and attack some of the opportunities that have come my way. All right. Thank you. I think that's uh, the way you wrapped up that question. It's probably another talk that you can, <laughs> that you can prepare for. Um, thanks, Zui, for taking those questions. I think, as, yeah, as I said, uh, we're, of course, uh, getting we're over time, so we can't answer all the questions, but we will export the questions, and then we'll just have a chat with uh, Zui after this and how he prefers to address them. Um, but just as a closing and wrapping up, uh, I'm just going to share my screen quickly, just things similar to what we spoke about a bit earlier. Um, just wanted to say thank you to our sponsors once again, uh, Peach Payments and Offers In for supporting our community and uh, helping us uh, host events like this uh, through their support. Um, I just want to give another shout for our tech leadership newsletter, uh, which I mentioned is a curated list for with uh, any tech leadership content that we've found that is interesting and will help you learn and grow in your tech leadership journey. Uh, we send this newsletter out once a month after every meetup. So this will be going out in about 30 minutes time. Uh, and this was an example of one we sent last year. Um, I just dropped links into the chat uh, and there's a link to the newsletter. If you want to sign up, you can just drop off your email there and you will receive the issue that's going out today. Uh, we also have a Tech Leadership Twitter account where we also post at least once a day, there'll be uh, an article or video which is tech leadership oriented. Uh, and also we announce our next events and the speakers on Twitter. So if you are a Twitter user, that could be the way you receive the content and learn from it. Uh, and of course, everything that keeps everyone excited. If you want some offers in swag, uh, grab the link now in that Zoom chat. You can fill it in after the meetup and they will be in touch with you uh, in terms of how to get that swag to you. And we really value and appreciate offers in for supporting our community once again with that. And then finally, uh, just once again, want to say thank you to Nzui, our speak speaker for the evening. Uh, it was a very insightful talk. It was great to hear about your journey and to learn from that. Uh, and very excited about what you're doing at Founders Factory Africa and what that's doing for African tech itself. 
Um, it is customary from the tech leadership community that we gift our speaker with a book. Uh, and that book is sponsored by Matchbox Solutions, which is Benny's company. Uh, we'll be in touch Zui, on uh, which book you're interested in getting. Um, and you can let us know and uh, Benny will coordinate how to get it to you. Um, else that should be it from us. Um, our next meetup will be in March uh, as per usual. We are thinking of experimenting with uh, doing this year a rotation of the online ones and perhaps uh, back to in-person in a COVID friendly way. So we can also meet up in person and, and have these meetups at a company's offices. So we're possibly going to do the March one uh, here in Cape Town at one of the offices if that goes through, but you will see it in the invite. If it doesn't work out for this next one, we will keep it online. So just watch for the invite that should be coming soon. Uh, but just thought I'd give you all a heads up on that. We will continue definitely with online and in person because we do understand that some people are actually not from Cape Town. So, and they're all getting value from this. But that's it from us. Thank you all for joining. Um, have a good evening.